Welcome to this week's Money Meadows podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these turbulent times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the low-cost precious metals dealer voted best in the U.S., Money Meadows Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. As we head into this Memorial Day weekend and remember those who have fought for our great country over the years, those who have given their lives the ultimate sacrifice to protect the freedoms we enjoy, we thought it appropriate to highlight on this week's podcast an issue and a man who is fighting for another form of freedom, that being our financial freedom. Not long ago, I spoke to Larry Parks of the Foundation for Monetary Education. For the past several decades, Larry has tirelessly advocated for sound money and freedom from governmental repression through a deliberate ongoing campaign of inflation and currency debasement. This corrupt system has also led to widespread debt enslavement while impoverishing many savers and wage earners across the globe. We hope you'll enjoy this interview and remember that when our liberty hangs in the balance, we must vigorously defend ourselves against those who would take away our freedoms, whether the threat be foreign or domestic. It's my privilege now to welcome in Lawrence Parks, founder and executive director of the Foundation of the Advancement of Monetary Education. Larry has dedicated much of his life towards the study and promotion of sound money, having authored articles that have appeared numerous times in publications like The Economist, The Washington Times, National Review, and The Wall Street Journal, just to name a few. He even hosts a weekly TV show that airs on cable networks in the Manhattan area called The Larry Park Show. He has given expert testimony in Washington to the United States Congress on monetary policy. He's a real champion for sound money, and it's great to have him on with us today. Larry, thanks for the time and welcome. It's good to talk to you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for hosting this. Well, Larry, to set the stage here, briefly give us some background about the foundation of the advancement of monetary education and, and what motivated you to take the helm of the organization nearly 25 years ago. Let's start there. I had been in the money management business, and I had noticed along the way that I was getting severe distortions in the valuations of the stocks that we used to cover. And I had known about the money issue. I had studied at one point with Murray Rothbard, and it wasn't my intention right from the very beginning to do this. I tried to get other uh, charities, other think tanks to pay attention to this, and nobody would touch it. Turns out there's a good reason for that. And somebody suggested to me along the way, why don't you do it? And I ended up doing it. And when we got started, we had all of the work that the Committee for Monetary Research and Education, that was Elizabeth uh, Curry's group, did. Uh, she had several hundred monographs a couple of which were authored by me. We had all that digitized. Uh, the people at the Foundation for Economic Education, that was Henry Stenholz at the time, uh, they had all the work of Henry Hazlitt. I don't know if you remember that name. Sure. Uh, he was from the Times. He wrote a book called uh, Common Sense Economics and Stuff on Gold. We had all that stuff. I had recruited roughly 30-some-odd board of advisors and board members, some of whom had worldwide reputations, and we were off and running. And I thought that uh, the gold space, especially the gold companies, would sponsor our work, but that never happened. And it's very interesting about how the people on the other side, on the paper money side, were able to co-op just about everybody and promulgate this, what I call imaginary fake money, into society on a worldwide basis. It's just utterly remarkable they got away with this. Now, you've made the point that gold is the most important of all the commodities in the world, even more so than oil. Explain why you believe that to be the case, if you would, please. The reason gold is the most important commodity is that gold is the only way to ensure payment. And so the way I like to explain it is that the glue that holds society together is keeping promises. So, for example, I make up with you. I'm going to be available at 3 o'clock today. If I don't keep my promise, that hurts the relationship. But the promises that are most important in society, aside from the promises that we make to family and friends, are the promises to pay, to pay pensions, to pay annuities, to pay savings, to pay rents, whatever. If those promises get broken, society unravels. And so uh, what happens is that people who have promises of, of payment, like take pensions, for example, pensions are really deferred wages. They depend on that promise being kept. And in turn, they make promises to other people, mindful that they're going to get paid. And if that chain gets broken, all of the interrelationships in society break down. And we've seen examples of that from more recorded history. 
And the thing about gold is that gold is the only way to ensure payment over a long period. People think about gold as money. They think about going to the grocery store. That's absurd. Nobody would use gold, you know, for day-to-day transactions. Gold is important for payment into the future. And so whatever it is that you use as money, say, for example, you use water, some of that water is going to spill. In the case of gold, you have no spillage. And the guy who really put his finger on this the best was a guy named Karl Menger. He's part of the so-called Austrian School of Economics, picked up at von Mises by Rothbard and others. And what they said was that gold is the most saleable, most, how shall I say, um, most efficient money. And the way they measure that, and it's really ingenious, if you look at all the things that could possibly be money, and the things that have been money, things like salt, cattle, copper, steel, all kinds of stuff, and you line them all up and you offer ever-increasing amounts of each into the marketplace, commodity for which the buy-sell spread increases the least, that's the most efficient money. And it just so happens that's gold. And no matter where you drop in in history, either in ancient times or in Renaissance times, today, say in the 19th century, cross-culture, cross-time, you see people using gold as money when it's available. So it's not like somebody came down from the heavens and said, look, in China, in the Mideast, in, in Europe, you have to use gold. Somehow, by trial and error, they just figured out that gold is the most efficient money. But again, it's the key to holding society together. Our listeners know that the market has, has chosen gold as the best form of money for thousands of years, as you've just explained, but it, it hasn't been openly used as money in recent decades. Talk about how and why gold was booted out of the world's monetary system, at least officially. Well, what's happened, and this also goes back to ancient times, it was generally the, the rulers of countries that said what the money was going to be. Best case is when the people themselves had decided what the money was going to be, but a lot of times the rulers of those countries got involved with coinage. They put their images on it. Uh, They set the standards. But a long time ago, um, people at the top of the heap figured a good way to steal was to debase the coinage. So in Renaissance times, when they started having precious metals as money, they used to clip the coinage. In modern times, they figured out with uh, things like fractional reserve lending that they could really, in effect, debase the money completely. The problem with gold from their point of view is that gold protects the the money. So if you have gold, you have what you have. The way I like to say this is there's no counterparty risk with gold. With everything else, you have counterparty risk that somebody will do something that would damage the value of your currency. So, for example, if I pay you with a check, Mike, you have counterparty risk that the check may not be good. And if I pay you with a dollar that we call a dollar today, which is not a dollar, but we, what I call a dollar today, you have counterparty risk that the issuing authority, in our case it's the banking system, the Federal Reserve and the banks, will depreciate the purchasing power of that money. And they tell you right out that they're going to do that. Uh, the jargon for that is called inflation targeting. And so you're always at risk that after some long period, you're not going to have what you think you have, or you're not going to pay what you think you're going to get paid. However, with gold, it is what it is. And uh, by getting rid of gold, they're able, in effect, to engage in really a massive amount of uh, thievery under the color of law, of course, where they transfer the wealth of society from the people who earn it, mostly ordinary working people, to the people who are in charge of the monetary system. And uh, we've developed on this end of the phone uh, data from primary sources, uh, in this case, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, they have on their website uh, one line for each year going back to 1934 when they got started of all the banking statistics. And up until the last tie to gold was broken, and that was in uh, 1971, the money that went to the banks, if you take, I can send anybody a chart on this if, if they wish. He says, just send me an email, Larry at LarryParks.com. It was a small amount of money. It was this, some number of billions. Since the last tie to gold was broken in 1971, it's in the trillions, trillions in dividends to their shareholders and in uh, trillions in compensation to their employees. That would not be possible with gold. And also in the sense of the politicians, and there's a very important book that people should take the time to read. It's called Fragile by Design. It's by a um, Columbia professor and his partner at, I think, uh, University of California, a guy named Stephen Haber. It's called Fragile by Design. 
And they document very nicely that there is, on a worldwide basis, what they call a grand bargain between the banking systems and the monetary authorities, banks, in effect, to have paper money. And when you have paper money, you can have unlimited spending. So a lot of people complain about the deficit, about debt and whatnot. Well, with paper money, there is no limit to how much money you can spend. And if you have unlimited spending, you get unlimited government. And if you have unlimited government, the people in charge have unlimited power. They like that. Gold stands in the way. And so what they've done at this end uh, in our country is even though the Constitution guarantees us, promises us gold and silver coin as money, they've pretty much gotten gold out of the system, and they've done it right from the, right from the get-go, I mean, right from the time, uh, right after the Revolution. And I have, uh, there's a ton of stuff from the 19th century where they recognize that gold is antagonistic to the paper money. And, of course, the way they get you to use it is they force you to use it with what's known as legal tender laws. Uh, again, another abomination. There was a recent documentary uh, financed and distributed by the Financial Times, and in that piece, one of their experts uh, says gold is like, quote, shiny poo. <laughs> he goes on to say that people who like gold are people who like to play with their poo. A silly comment, to say the least, but on a serious note, uh, how do you explain the disdain for gold among financial elites, Larry? Because this individual's comments are, are quite often shared by many. I can explain it in four words. Gold pays no fees. So the people in the financial world, especially on Wall Street, Wall Street is a fee business. So when people uh, have savings, and a lot of people who, uh, are concerned, especially people who are at the upper end, they're concerned about intergenerational wealth transfer, leaving money to their kids. And people who retire, you know, or, who are facing retirement or plan to retire, they have an issue. How should I allocate my money? And as far as Wall Street's concerned, they want you to allocate in a way that generates fees for them. In the case of gold, and really the best thing that people can do for, for savings for the, for the future is to buy gold. I mean, my favorite is our U.S. gold eagles, and put them away. But if you do that, where are the fees for Wall Street? And so what they've done, and it's really a, a incredible what they've gotten away with in, in the pension business. So, for example, in defined benefit pension plans in America, there are roughly $10 trillion worth of investable assets, $10 trillion, and no gold. The only gold position that I can identify is the Texas Teachers Retirement System. They have a billion-dollar position in physical gold out of roughly $140 billion of investable assets. But the other $10 trillion, there's no gold. And they have roughly something on the order of 20-some-odd uh, percent, I think it's like less I look around, 24, 25 percent of these assets in fixed income. On the theory, uh, these are government bonds and, and corporate bonds, on the theory that people are safer. But in fact, uh, the icon of American investing, that would be Warren Buffett, uh, he said in one of his chairman's letters from his Berkshire Hathaway company, followed up with an article in Fortune magazine, that the most unsafe, the most risky assets are currency-denominated assets. And he specifically targets bonds. And the reason they're unsafe and risky and this is the only risk that you have to be concerned about is that at the end of the, of the holding period that you have less purchasing power than when you started. And the answer is that things like fixed income, that's a guaranteed loser. And so how do you explain that, these, that you have $10 trillion, you have roughly $2.5 trillion in the most risky, most unsafe investment and no allocation to gold? And, of course, the answer is, as they said, gold pays no fees. And so really what you have here is really cheating people on a massive sketch. I mean, it's unbelievable how they've gotten away with this. And in the last couple of years, there's been talk about having these investment advisors having a fiduciary responsibility to their customers, and they defeated that. So basically, the way Wall Street works is that they're in it for the fees. If the customer gets a good result, that's a happy accident. And so today... And I'll tell you, it's, Mike, it's an incredible scandal. It doesn't get enough press. There's 150 of these so-called multi-employer pension funds that are on the Department of Labor critical list, which is to say they're bust. And millions of workers are involved. And, I mean, what's their remedy? I mean, what, what, what should these people do when they turn 65 or 70, whatever, and they can't work anymore and their bodies are broken from the, from the, from the work that they used to do and they have no money? How are they supposed to live?
And so really what's happening in the country today is that there is, I perceive, a huge swing towards socialism. And in my view, we are at best two election cycles, maybe one election cycle away from the country going socialist. And I don't know how many people watched the uh, State of the Union address by uh, uh, President Trump, but he went out of his way to say, in very strong terms, he said, we're not going to have a socialist country. Now, you've never heard any other president say something like that. And the fact that he felt compelled to say that, they recognize also that there is a swing towards socialism, and that would be an enormous tragedy. We are on the glide path right now to Venezuela. Uh, switching gears here a little bit, you talk to mining executives and you have the, your finger on the pulse there. So I want to ask you, uh, do you think they believe there is price suppression in the metals markets? And as a follow-up, if they believe there is, which to us it seems hard to deny at this point, why don't mining executives cry foul? Because it, it seems as though their companies would be the most impacted. Is that that they just don't want to call out the very banks that they're so dependent upon for credit or something else? Because the lack of an outcry from mining leaders has always baffled me, Larry. Well, it's it's not only uh, baffling, uh, although I'll, I'll give you an explanation for it, but it's disheartening. You know, these folks have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders and also to themselves, but except for people like Rob McEwen, very good guy, and uh, Rudy Frank, uh, Rob McEwen has uh, McEwen Gold, Rudy Frank at Seabridge, very few have any kind of material interest in the companies at all. I mean, they're in it for the payroll. But in their defense, and it's not a great defense, but it is a defense, they don't know anything about this business with gold and the monetary system. I mean, these guys... And uh, I don't think there's any women running any of these companies anymore. There was one woman. Uh, she sold out to Barrick some time ago. I forget her name. But basically, these people uh, went to the Colorado School of Mines or its equivalent. Some of them have accounting degrees, and that's it. And also, until recently, none of these people were from America. So if you look at all the major gold companies or important gold companies, they're all headed by foreigners. So they don't know anything about the constitutional issues here in America. Why would they? So right now you have two. You have uh, this fellow, John Thornton, who uh, just took over a couple of years ago, Barrick Gold. He's an American. And uh, Gary Goldberg, who runs in, uh, Newmont. But before Thornton took over, it was Peter Monk. Peter Monk came from Hungary, grew up in Hungary, educated in Switzerland, considered himself a Canadian. Newmont was Jimmy Goldsmith, a, a, a Brit, and all the rest are from other parts of the world. I mean, nobody knows anything about the, the provisions, the history, and it's really America that's led the way on this, not any other kind of country. So, um, and there's a whole story to this, and I know we, don't, we only have a few minutes for this uh, podcast, but back in 1944-45, uh, uh, when the Bretton Woods Conference met, really the, the die was set there to get gold completely out of the system. Roosevelt did his part in 1933, but uh, after uh, Bretton Woods, and the idea was that the United States dollar would be convertible into gold for foreign governments and foreign central banks. At that time, it was still a felony for Americans to own gold. And that's an interesting question that you, know, you don't get an answer to. I mean, what is the public policy justification for making gold ownership in America a felony? Well, where have you seen that question asked in any economics textbook? And basically, uh, the, the guys who run these gold companies, they don't know about this. And why should they? They're geologists, they're mining engineers. It's not part of their, their study. Here in America, the educational system is highly controlled, especially uh, at the college level. Nobody gets ahead in economics talking the way I'm talking. And the uh, Huffington Post, somebody did a study, uh, and it turns out that, you know, if you want to get ahead in the academy, you have to publish and it turns out that just about all the important economic journals are edited by present or former employees of the Federal Reserve. And you don't get ahead. So basically, there's a, there's a lack of knowledge, and gold is denigrated. And so the quotes that you gave from the, that Financial Times, imagine the Financial Times sponsoring, I think that documentary, it's called something like The Dangerous Obsession. If you go on YouTube, you can uh, search those uh, keywords, Dangerous Obsession. I mean, it's just uh, outrageous that uh, an expert should say it's like poo. I mean, this is really crazy. But that's the level that we have now. And when you start talking about gold, people pigeonhole you. They say, you must be a gold bug, which is a derogatory statement. Anyway, as far as the guys who run the mines are concerned, they're in for the salaries. They get good salaries. And like I say, very few of them have any skin in the game. And that's it.
They don't know the vocabulary. They don't know what you're talking about. They defer to the World Gold Council, which is uh, basically the World Jewelry Council. And that's been a thought on my side the whole time I'm at this. Yeah, that's, I think, the conclusion we've drawn as well. There's no great explanation as to why these guys are completely AWOL when it comes to the suppression schemes. We have had Keith Newmeyer, uh, CEO of First Majestic Silver, who was a very outspoken individual when it comes to the manipulation, and uh, at least there are some out there that are doing that. Uh, well, Larry, as we begin to close here, uh, tell folks how they can get involved or perhaps how they can partner with you in your efforts to help advance sound money policy, other than making a fully tax-deductible donation to FAME, which uh, can be done at FAME.org. Talk about what people might do to join in the fight to help restore fiscal responsibility and sound money to our nation's monetary policy. Well, the first thing, they're going to have to invest some of the most valuable resource, and that's their time to learn about this. And we have on, on our website, especially the issues summary, I mean, it's, it's simple to do. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance here, but we could use introductions, especially introductions to trustees of pension funds. And one of the big opportunities, I think, to get uh, interest in gold, we need to build a constituency for gold in the United States, and there is no such constituency today. I think in December, it's a proxy for this, the Mint sold something like 3,000 gold eagles. I mean, that's nothing. It's like a, a tenth of a ton. To put that into perspective for you, the mines produce about 3,000 tons a year, and there's roughly 200,000 tons above ground. A tenth of a ton is nothing. And you know, because you're in the business, people keep denigrating gold. So really, the opportunity to build a constituency is to get gold into pension funds. And you, I know you know about this, Mike. I don't know if your, your listeners know about it. But we just had three bills that went down in flames in Wyoming, which were going to compel the state of Wyoming. We had, we had about 17 uh, representatives out of 60 vote in favor of it. But uh, all of these pension funds are naked. And if these pension funds just had some gold, at least people would start taking an interest in what's happened here. And what's happened will not stand the light of day. Like I said, this is just out-and-out out thievery, stealing from ordinary people their future payments. It's not like they come to your house and take, take what you have, but really uh, we're on a glide path to Venezuela, as I said, but we could use introductions. So if, if the people can't make a donation, refer us to a trustee of a pension fund, any kind of pension fund. And I'm particularly interested in people who run pension funds for organized labor. And the reason for that is that organized labor, they employ lobbyists, and they have pull, and they're the principal victims. So they're the ones who could really make a difference here. Well, it's certainly been a great honor to speak with you, and, and we greatly enjoyed the conversation. Uh, keep up the great work. You guys are doing fantastic work there. People should go to fame.org and make a contribution. You've just heard Larry. He's dedicated a lot of his life to this uh, effort, and it's a very noble one. And uh, we certainly appreciate you coming on the, the Money Metals podcast. Take care, Larry. It's a real pleasure. Thank you, Mike. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to Larry Parks of the Foundation of the Advancement of Monetary Education. For more information, visit the website fame.org, and please consider making a contribution to this important and vital cause. Again, you can do that and find out plenty of other information on these topics as well at fame.org. And check back here next Friday for our next weekly market wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening, and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes. For answers to all of your questions, or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds, call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.